hello, good afternoon everybody. Thank you, I know you've had a long day. So um, thank you, Dr. Garson. And actually, uh, even though we have, do have an amazing group of speakers here today, we are actually hoping to put you all to work uh, and have this uh, be a very interactive session. And it's nice that we're in um, a good space to have that conversation. So I feel like, so our session, um, What's justice got to do with it? Ethical implications of social policies on health. We are a sort of a part two of what you guys learned about last week in the social determinants of health. How many people here um, either participated in the session last week or watched it online? Anybody? A bunch of people? Okay. Um, we're having drug music in the background here. Um, so a number of you already participated last week. So last week they talked about how social determinants can impact our health. And this week, we're sort of going beyond that to talk about the ethical issues surrounding social determinants of health. And I thought it was really nice because at the very last minute of last week's talk, somebody asked a question related to, like, we really need to make, want to make a difference do we, do we need to be a blue state or a blue area? Um, and uh, it's brought up the issue of social justice. And there was only one minute to talk at the very end, which was perfect because that was a segue into our presentation today. Um, and what we're gonna do today is have uh, everybody introduce themselves and just say why we're sitting together at the table to talk about social determinants of health, ethics, and policy. We are gonna go over a couple of cases and then ask questions to generate or stimulate discussion related to some of the ethical issues. So again, uh, as Dr. Carson mentioned, I'm Joey Fisher. I'm in internal medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and have been, uh, I was the chair of the ethics committee at Bentob for many years and am now the chair of the system ethics committee. So that's sort of my ethics background. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lunchtoth. I'm gonna to be the co-moderator today. And you can read my bio, but I think more importantly, as um, in my role at the medical school, um, I'm working very hard to integrate social justice into our curriculum and the social determinants. And I think that's probably one of the reasons I'm here. So I'm thrilled to be here. I'm Karen Zung. I'm a Senior Vice President for Population Health Transformation at Harris Health System and also hold a fellow appointment um, at the Baker Institute over at Rice. Um, was thinking that um, a particular perspective that I could contribute today's, to today's discussion is the on the ground experience working at uh, the third largest safety net system in the country and working hand in hand with our clinical partners uh, struggling with questions of resource allocation across our very large health system. The need can be almost infinite, a uh, vertical curve, if you will, for the downstream acute medical care, given the broader policy and um, lack of access context that we find ourselves in Harris County. But how are we moving forward a priori to make a commitment to the upstream and to allocate resources in sort of um, uh, that, that, that a priori way? Hi, I'm a Brett Perkison. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas School of Public Health. I'm a, a clinician and uh, in family medicine as well as occupation and environmental medicine. And uh, I've had experience in, uh, really I think one of the main reasons I'm up here today is, is really the environmental aspect of how that factors into a social determinant of health, uh, as we'll sort of see in these case examples. My name is Ann Barnes, and I, like Joey, am an internist by training. Um, although now I'm not actively seeing patients, I'm in an administrative role as Chief Medical Officer at Legacy Community Health. Um, and second to Harris Health, we're the largest safety net provider um, in the area. Um, and I think a perspective that I can bring to the conversation um, probably starts at what compelled me to think about health um, in the patients I cared for beyond the clinical encounter. I had a focus on weight management, and a lot of the recommendations I made were hard to implement when people walked out of the clinic and went back into their lives. And so um, an appreciation for social determinants of health and how hard it is sometimes to move the needle on those 
um, is, I think, one of the things that I can bring to the conversation today. I'm Courtney Bruce. I'm an associate professor over at Methodist as well as with Texas A&M. My background is in ethics. I did a lot of clinical ethics for a number of years for Methodist and in the hospital, actually addressing ethical issues, usually conflicts between family members or between family members and clinicians at the end of life. Um, now I'm over in, in system quality operations and do a lot of patient communication and, and other interventions to try to mitigate uh, process issues across the hospital system. What I'm doing today is I'm helping to moderate, and actually the reason why I've been brought to this table is really less to do about the topic and more to do with my love for this class. Every year I help moderate this class just because I think it is absolutely essential to learn how to ethically deliberate, to think how to ethically deliberate, and think about how the ethical considerations actually, how they weave into your, your life and your professional life, personally and professionally especially if you work clinically. I want you to kind of think of that uh, as you approach um, you, you know, your job. So that's really why I'm here today. A little bit of a different angle than these folks, but um, nonetheless, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And we're gonna start off with learning a little bit about an ethics framework. How many people here have actually taken a course in ethics before? Anybody? Some people? Okay, a lot, so people. A lot of people. Good. So we're just gonna start off with like framing some of the ethical principles? So in medical ethics, um, there's these four principles. You've got autonomy, beneficence, and non-maleficence. And those are all duties that a clinician has to their patient. One-on-one -on -one obligation. What's the fourth principle? Justice. The fourth principle is justice. And justice is owed to whom? Right. So we've got these three principles who we, whose obligation sits before us, if you're a clinician. But this fourth principle, justice, is to everyone. And it's pretty easy to ignore everyone, right? versus that person sitting before you. So I like to call it the bastard principle because we're not necessarily, who's holding us accountable for meeting our, the principle of justice? Think about that. Either, even if you're a public health practitioner, I mean, who is actually holding us accountable? But there are principles. There's, there's these principles of distributive justice. And one of the things that makes the justice principle even harder to, to meet is the fact that we have not come to a consensus on how we should fairly distribute resources. And we all think of this very differently. So we're in the great state of Texas, um, and even the United States, if you look into the history, it was founded on libertarian policies. So if you adhere to a, libert a libertarian type of philosophy, you may think that allocation, allocation of resources, the fair allocation of resources, should be based on the ability to pay. That is one way of thinking about how to distribute resources. And for some people, that is fair. And then on the other completely opposite spectrum, one could, one could argue that resources should be fairly distributed based on need. How do we define need? So that is one of the very reasons why this principle of justice, which we're gonna talk about tonight, has been so hard to get at. One is that we, don't, we have this huge obligation that is owed to everyone and that obligation is to fairly distribute resources. But how do we do that? And there's absolutely no consensus. So with that as a frame, we're gonna... <laughs> but, but, I would, I, but in doing that, I would ask each of you to think about how do you think resources should be fairly allocated? And, and you've got everything from need to want to, it should operate in a free market based on the ability to pay. 
And so, I, again, how do you think it should be done? And, and when we talk about this, I want you to go back to this. How should it be allocated? How should it be allocated? Because this is the, one of the most difficult ethical problems that we have to solve, is coming to a consensus. So that was a beautiful lead-in by saying we like consensus, and now we're going to try to um, try to think through how to answer some of these challenging questions. Uh, I've got a case, and we've got a case actually that's going to cue us up for conversation, and we're going to be turning it over to you pretty quickly. So here we've got Miss Jones. Can you all see that? Okay, we've got Miss Jones. She's a 34-year-old single mother with asthma in a small carpeted home in southeast Harris County. She has an eight-year-old daughter who also has asthma. Their house flooded in Hurricane Harvey. Ms. Jones and her daughter have been in several emergency rooms for asthma exacerbations over the last two years. This case is packed. Every other word is a social determinant. Can you guys tell me some of the social determinants that are really sticking out to you? Single. She's single. Okay. How is that a social determinant? Can you tell me how? Resources. Okay. Her resources are very limited. She may not be able to go to the grocery store when her child is sleeping. She's pulled in a lot of directions. She can't miss work, likely. Can't take off for child uh, needs for these asthma exacerbations. Okay, that's the first determinant. We've got about 15 others. What, other, what, what else do we see? Southeast Harris County. Okay, what do we see in Southeast Harris County? Challenges with housing. Housing. Surrounding the resources. Okay, what, I heard some other, some other comments. Yeah, chemical plants. Chemical plants are there. Hello, yeah, chemical plants are there. What have we just noticed recently? Fires. Yeah, fires. And, and a lot of reports from um, different organizations telling us everything's great. Everything's great. And didn't um, at least one of you saw several patients recently right after that fire? Yeah. Can you speak to that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so, you know, so I, I, my uh, clinic is down, down in that area really sort of where Pasadena and Clear Lake run into each other. And so the uh, yeah, the clinic has been has been just flooded with patients with respiratory related symptoms, um, uh, eyes, lungs, nose, everything respiratory. Uh, people with asthma has been greatly exacerbated by that, and uh, a lot of people just concerned. I mean, you've probably <coughs> seen the news reports uh, that benzene was released, and so uh, we've drawn benzene levels on a number of peaceful patients because they were con concerned more than you know what. What we would expect to see, but that uh, uh, causes a lot of trauma when you live down there in that area. If you have any relatives, I think you uh, to speak on that. It's a it's a concern when they're exposed to that kind of acute exposure there. That's definitely timely. Okay, what other determinants are sticking out? She has a chronic condition. She has a chronic condition. What makes that a social determinant? I agree. What makes it a social determinant? Maintenance. Hmm. Self care and maintenance. Well, lo yeah, lots of maintenance issues. It's going to require a lot of upkeep, follow-up, timely treatment, a lot of really quick access to help with the asthma. What, el what else? Okay, we got the asthma, and then we still got about four more. We <laughs> got the environment. Yeah, look at this. House flooded, and what was the house, the house co uh, covered with? Carpet. What happens when carpet floods? Mold. You got all sorts of mildew and mold and yucky stuff that's going to require an incredible amount of resources to try to clean and dry out. I mean, you got to take out everything. How many of you have been impacted by a show of hands by Harvey? Right, only one person. How much? Can I ask you how long it took you to get your place back up and running? Uh, Harvey, um, it was because we did have flood insurance about six to eight months. Okay, so for six to eight months, you had to find somewhere else to live, and not everyone has the luxury of that. While it all, and you had flood insurance, which makes you yeah, it was very. My unique. mother, she actually had to live with me. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, and, yeah. And, and for all those flood. people who didn't have flood insurance, right. think about those folks. And this whole house is destroyed basically because it's carpeted. Yes. Uh, then we see Miss Jones. Have we picked up all of them? The emergency. The emergency room. What do we know about emergency? A lot of you are clinicians. What happens in emergency rooms? What it's basically become what? A primary care. care. Yeah, it's primary care. It's and, and and what do the bills look like for that? I mean, even for those of us who are insu insured and have jobs, it's outrageous, right? So that is definitely something that's a little bit of a challenge. 
Among yourselves, we're going to this next question. It's packed. What ethical and professional obligations do healthcare providers have to consider social determinants in the care of their patients? What are we even looking for there? Think about it just on an individual level right now. We're not getting to the the uh, the systems level or the or the you know societal level. Just at the individual level, as a healthcare professional, what sorts of obligations do they have, and how far do those obligations extend? In other words, I've got this patient, Miss Jones, right in front of me with her eight-year-old daughter. What do I need to do to care for her, recognizing that there are all these other social determinants? How do I, how, you know, do I have to actually supply her with equipment to help clean up the house? Should I somehow help with these asthma exacerbations on a more long-term basis beyond the kind of, kind of care I can provide in this immediate setting? Do I have to help her find the resources to take care of this? At what point does my obligation end? Do I have to advocate for her? Do I have to actually try to change health policy on a broader scale, where does my obligation end? Where does it begin? Because I could ignore it altogether and not do right by her or, her or her child, probably. Or I can take that somewhere further and try to help her. Now, what does help actually look like? So amongst yourselves, if you don't mind talking in like groups of two to four, think about that question. Where does my obligation begin as a practitioner, any practitioner, I don't, you know, your physician, NP, whoever you are, or whoever you want to be in this case scenario. Where does your obligation begin and where does it end? When have you fully discharged your responsibilities in trying to help this particular patient? And what does that even look like to help her? So be thinking about that for the next three or so minutes and we'll come back and try to hear from you. And there's no right or wrong answers. We just really want to hear from you as to, as to what you're thinking. Do you want to add something? Can I see that for a second? That's good. <laughs> You have a primary care practice? Yeah, uh, uh, with PT physicians. Uh, so they one day a week, they're nice enough to let me practice down there for one full day. And it's primary care. I'm, gonna de I'm developing an occupational medicine practice down there as well. So do you have any other sort of Experimenting with that, trying to, to get business. When I was at Strawberry, I actually developed an occupational medicine practice yeah, out there. The, in the clinic, you know what I find. What I'm hopefully going to get a chance to mention tonight is there's so many occupational-related illnesses and injuries that we miss every day in a primary it's, care it's clinic. Yeah. You know, for things that are caused at work or the environment, for that matter. And uh, you know, just recognizing that I think is important. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and it's it's a <coughs> difficult question. I mean, benzene exposure, as you know, I mean that takes years to to develop, and and it shows up as as a leukemia that's totally indistinguishable from a leukemia that wasn't caused by it. So. You know, when we have people on the benzene surveillance program in the plant, we monitor their complete blood cell count once a year. That's our surveillance program, <laughs> waiting for their blood cell count to fall. Yeah, so it's kind of after the fact. Very downstream, yeah. 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 Very downstream, yeah. Very primitive, really. Do you guys have a feel for how many people are providers you know, that are either mid-levels or physicians or whatever? I was going to talk a little bit about coding for these things. Like, you, you know, I was doing coding exposure to air pollutants, you know, during this last week. This, this Sunday, the epidemiologist is going to come along. And, First, you have to see where she stands and see what are the issues that she has. Do they accept or recognize a patient that they have those issues? If they feel like, oh, it's fine where I'm at, then you're just spinning your wheels of trying to provide all the resources to support her. 
and then she might not be engaged or willing to accept Yeah, exactly. That's so, one thing first. Can I, can I press you on that a little bit? Only because I know you and I know you're very skilled, so I know you're not going to be able to you. I work with a clinic lead, so I can see you. It's really good. Um, so how do you do that? Like, how do you see, you know, we say this all the time in the end-of-life context, see where they're at, see where they're at, see what their understanding is. You can't ask what is your understanding of, that's mm -hmm. insulting and disparaging, mm -hmm. and it has a lot of value laden I think, um, connotations mm -hmm. associated with understanding. So how do you, practically speaking, elicit, and I totally agree with you, how do you practically elicit where they're at and how engaged they are and willing they are to accept additional resources that we might provide? And, and it doesn't necessarily need to be that answer that answers. Although, it'd be great if we would. One thing that I mentioned to her is that what is important to her, right? So, uh, because we have someone, we have a client who's somewhat in the same, well, it's a male and he's not, he's single, but um, what is important to you? You know, your house got flooded, you're here, you have severe asthma, poor control. What's important to you and how can we help? Very good. It's a very good strategy. Any other tips that you get? Yeah. No, for me, a lot of times I start with the our common goal, which a lot of times for me as a school nurse is the, the child, mm -hmm. and we all want what's best for the child. And then once we can kind of get on that same page, then it kind of ripples out into what are the mm -hmm. things that you're missing or needing. Mm -hmm. and, then, and listening, listening. Sometimes we do a lot of talking um, and don't hear what they're saying. So a lot of listening and then referring and trying to find those resources that they, they can kind of match up with what they're saying. Okay. Okay. Very good. So some of the, uh, so I've been reminded that we're taping, and so I should repeat what we're, what we're hearing. <laughs> so uh, I, my question was, uh, the overall question was, um, how do we how do we know where our obligation begins or ends? And a lot of people said, well, it begins by at least asking where they're at and how willing they are to provide resources. And I pressed on that and said, how do you practically do that? And some of the responses that were given, well, one is I ask what's important to them, or at least try to draw out what's important to them and then seize on what is really sticking out to me as being the area that I'm really going to focus in on, which is awesome and right on point. Another comment, another strategy that we heard from a school nurse is I use the child being the source of uh, where we all have common interests, where we all want to protect and serve the best interests of this child, so let's get on this, try to feel each other out for what is on the same page, how to maximize the child's health. Well, both of those are excellent tips, and frankly, ones you can use in just about any setting when it comes to, to doing right by your patient. Uh, returning to the broader question of where the, the obligations begin and end, what other things did you guys come up with as a group? Yes. So that was a really good point. Someone mentioned, well, are clinicians necessarily even best positioned or well positioned to address whatever the, uh, the social determinants are? And he said, the least I can do is at least refer them to an expert who could mm -hmm. address the resources. Maybe that's a social worker or someone else. Yes? There's going to be a huge variability in what you are, what system of care, mm -hmm. where that person lives, what sort of access to, to care they're going to have when they leave that emergency room. Right? So there's a short term immediate need. And then there's a longer term need, intermediate and longer term, and so the question becomes what do I address? Bigger than that. Should I just address the need or how do I get it the Well that's the easy thing. Yeah. So you know what I think it would be uh, interesting to hear from some of our clinicians yeah. to so see yeah. just a couple things I might add. Um, so knowing your patient population, you know, is one thing. And uh, and, and like you guys mentioned, is, have any of y'all done motivational interviewing? Familiar with that? Yeah. So you know, some of the things that you were saying, you, know, you, don't, you don't tell the patient what to do. You let them kind of see where they're at and what they're capable of doing. And so knowing your patient population, um, you can make recommendations. So for instance, um, in this case of asthma, if there's an occupational exposure or indoor air exposure, a HEPA filter may be an expense that they may not be able to afford. That may be you know, too much. But maybe changing out an air conditioner filter, um, well, once a month instead of once every three months, you know that that can make a big difference. Um, a lot of communities will, um, uh, will, or some cultures will have a lot of potpourri and in the or incense in the home, 
and that are the air freshener, the little Febreze things you plug in, that can make a big difference. Or burning candles, um, that those things can make big differences in uh, reducing asthma exposures. As you guys know, you know asthma is caused by uh, multiple variables, and so you, you may not get all of them, but getting any of them, getting the low-hanging fruit, you know, can make a big difference. And so, you know, really talking to where a person's able to make a change. I actually was going to ask a question there related to that um, because the question is, is should we be doing that? I mean, you're an expert, <laughs> so but some of the other as others of us may not know that changing an air conditioning filter is good. Maybe it's not as good as having a HEPA filter. Um, do we? Is, is, should we do about those social determinants of health as healthcare practitioners? Um, and how again back to the question how how much should we be asking our patients and asking of ourselves as as healthcare professionals yeah so you know i i, I practice family medicine and occupational environmental medicine so i'm both an expert and a generalist and and, and as you all know you be, we all can become ex somewhat experts at really any given field if you spend a little time you know reading about it and so so, so let's say your, your practice is in an area that has been flooded. Um, uh, getting Healthy Homes, the Healthy Homes Initiative, for instance, is a public information available online, and they can go through some of these recommendations. And I think that is within the purview of primary care. Um, and that's, that's, uh, this is a primary care problem. And so um, for whatever thing, if there was some particular exposure in your community, we, you know this benzene uh, exposure with the with the tank fires. You know, reading a little bit about benzene, you may not be the talk. I end up being a toxicologist, but you can make some some some. Uh, I think reasoned scientific comments about what what exposure limits to be concerned about, what side effects to look at, and that that's all within our you know within our purview. I, just, I, wanted, okay, I was going to sorry. I was just going to follow up that, and then I'm going to let you know. Out of, just a show of hands, how many of you guys have ever had a healthcare professional ask you if you have carpet in your house? Some people, well, wow. that's good. Wow. <laughs> that's, <laughs> more, <laughs> more hands than I thought. Um, and if you flooded, did anybody ask if you guys flooded? So no one asked me. Okay, well, actually, I'm surprised. I would have thought there would be some other hands the other way. But yeah, it's already in. I just I wanted to share a little bit about um, our practical experience with finding where people are related to social determinants of health. So um, in three of our clinics, we've implemented a program called Health Leads. And you can uh, see what it's about on, on a TED Talk. Um, Rebecca Oni um, is the founder. Um, and we assess social determinant needs um, in all of the patients who come in for their well checks. And so we felt one obligation was actually just knowing um, what needs are um, and expressing to our patients that we care about their life and health outside of the clinical setting. Um, and then they self-disclose um, the places where they're struggling. And then we also ask the follow-up question, which gets to autonomy. Um, do you want assistance mm -hmm. in this area that you've identified? And I will say I was totally <coughs> wrong about this. I thought it would be 100%. Of course I want help. Um, but a lot of people say, no, I'm not interested in help. Or I have these three things. I'll accept help in this one area. Um, and so I, I found that to be really yeah, incredible. Definitely. And it's a very sort of practical manifestation of trying like to identify that. people where they are. And what we've done, because we recognize too, we don't have enough social workers to, to help everybody, and we can't have every agency embedded in our health system. So it really is about leveraging resources in the community to try to help individuals uh, meet their needs. But that first obligation was to ask and, and to hear, and then the second to, to do what the patient wants done, and then to, co to connect us. I think that speaks to, I, I'm a motivational interviewing trainer. Oh, so. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think every health provider should be trained. I agree. But it, it makes me think of the principle of partnership mm -hmm. that MI is so, so grounded in. And, and, and so is Team Steps. You know, Team Steps looks at the patient as a full partner mm -hmm. of the healthcare team. And I think the more that we think we're, we're trudging along in that direction as, a, as an overall American healthcare system, I think we're, we're slow, but the more that we move in that direction, I think the, the more that we are going to be able to help, to be helpful. 
Can I return to a point you mentioned, which is be at least familiar with the resources in your community? You all are very familiar with resources mm -hmm. in their community. I'm not sure that your everyday clinician might be mm -hmm. familiar with that. So how could they become apprised of the types of resources to help triage it? Because I agree, social mm -hmm. workers can't mm -hmm. fix everything, nor can they actually even maybe even see everybody with an adequate amount of time. I mean, I think, I think that in, in seeing whatever form of continuing medical education that your profession is, is that um, the area of disaster preparedness will take the flooding you know, part of this question. I think that that's, that's increasing. There's an awareness of that as these natural disasters increase, as we're more concerned about climate change, things like that, 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 that that's out there. And so flooded homes is definitely um, a category there. Um, so, I mean, I'm speaking from the standpoint of knowing the, the primary care literature, the occupational environmental medicine literature, but I think, you know, in, 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 in nursing, you know, it's, it's, it's increasing, I know. Uh, that, it, that it really, in our age of online learning, that at least sort of a cursory knowledge should, should be available. And then I guess the secondary source would be uh, the uh, Harris, County, uh, Harris County Public Health Department. Um, they're dealing with all these problems, and they do have literature, and they are there, they are there for you uh, to provide, you know, provide information and, and resources for you. Speaking of that, I think Harris County, right? Sure. So can think of a couple of um, observations on this really rich thread, this really rich discussion. First is, on this most recent point, how many folks in the room are familiar with United Way's 211 resource directory? So I think we recognize um, that to embark on this team-based work, to borrow a term from um, one of our participants, <laughs> It takes a village to do this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we don't go to medical school necessarily to become experts in every single health-related social need, nor could we. So um, there are certain, what we've been thinking of at Harris Health as uh, common goods or public goods that everyone needs access to build this village effectively, whether you're a solo practitioner all the way to a very large 8,500 person um, healthcare system. Granted, we have the resources and we feel the imperative to build that infrastructure because we are such a large enterprise. But even there, I push our uh, team all the time to say we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to come up with our own community resource uh, directory and keep it up to date when United Way is doing 211 for the entire community. So I think that's one principle. It's, it takes a village and our three-part process uh, that we, our, our, our three-pronged strategy uh, that we're embarking on at Harris Health is to look at our brick and mortar enterprise, start at home with each of our clinics, and to brick by brick develop a cross section of them as uh, a demonstration into more integrated health hubs, from medical homes to health hubs. Mm -hmm. um, so what words are very critical that were um, changed from patient medical home to community health hub? One, recognizing that the patient and the autonomy, that's, that's at the center of uh, uh, that medical home concept, but that if you're really getting at health and not just health care, that you have to bring in that broader community. Just like the teacher, it takes a village. Um, if the kid is struggling with reading, having that partnership with the parents, having that partnership with the aunt or with the folks in the community, there might be things that you're completely missing as a teacher, such as the child is nearsighted. And no amount of going to teaching school is going to help you get, you know, be the specialist that gets that kid's glasses. That's, that's true in, 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 in health as well. So um, uh, from, from patient center to, to recognizing that, that community role, um, that where our patients live, work, and play may be more, it, it is part of the record. It should become part of the clinical record. And then from um, community, fr from medical uh, home to health hub is just recognizing that sometimes a specialist we need to refer to is not the pulmonologist, but is um, the housing uh, attorney who can get that landlord to remediate. Um, and that specialist is going to be, um, the low hanging fruit opportunities is that, there, that, that, that in our daily practice at Harris Health, we probably haven't had to get to the really tricky um, trade-offs. Uh, is it this or is it this? Because the good news is that there is 
there is great road left to be traveled. There are so many low-hanging fruit opportunities where it's both less expensive and more efficacious, quicker, and gets to the root cause. Um, so uh, in developing those community-aware, uh, community-informed um, health hubs, um, that three-part strategy is shift some of the direct services we budget for. Uh, the health system of 50 years ago might have been predominantly clinicians, but we have a significant number of FTEs now that are, their titles are social workers, community health workers, case managers, navigators, and uh, we call it King Arthur's Roundtable because that team, there's no head and there's no foot. Having a white coat doesn't make you, there's not that hierarchy. It's that we all have a co-equal opportunity to impact uh, the patient outcome. So it's, it's what direct services we're paying for. It's co-locating social resources on site for the top health-related social needs. But most importantly, where we began this thread was, it's also serving as a virtual referral site for all of the rest of the village that we're never gonna become, nor should we because it's not the most effective use of resources. It's deepening those community referrals to housing, um, to, 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 the, to the attorney specialist, to all of those other specialists. So it's a warm handoff um, for our patients. Yep, and go yep. back and go back to this one. Okay, we'll go, go back to this yeah. one. Yes, because we did because yes. of the autonomy <laughs> element. Uh, thanks. So we did a few different thoughts came through. We heard the autonomy word at least a couple of different times. So now let's just add some more complexity to the case and really try to delve into the autonomy uh, element, which is here definitely. Miss Jones reveals she smokes one pack of cigarettes daily. So we're continuing the case. She reports that she often does not have enough money to pay for her own or her daughter's asthma medications. Okay, so there's, a ton, there's, a ton, there's a definitely an, a, an autonomy element here. Can anyone tell me what it is? She's making a decision. She's making a decision that seems to be voluntary, at least at, on the surface, that is probably of her own willing. How do we factor that into our equation, or do we factor that into our equation? Do we just say, oh... This is all her fault and walk away? Or do we try, how do we balance that? How do we balance the autonomy elements with our other obligations here, which are some real obligations to try to do right by her and her daughter? So what do you think? How do we balance those two considerations? What do we think of when we think of autonomy? Tell me what words come to your mind. Respect the person. Thank you. I was hoping somebody was going to say that. Respect for the person. It doesn't really matter what kind of decisions they're making. You still got to respect them. It's just a matter of how we respect them. What does it actually mean in practice to do that? So tell me, tell me, how would you balance those different considerations? Or is that just re really a struggle? What, do you, what about the panel? What do, you, what do you guys think? I mean, I don't think we have any easy answers. If we did, we'd have all, the, we'd have all of this solved, or at least some of it solved. I'm just going back to what the school nurse said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, focusing in on the, the child mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a joint you know, this is what our goal is to improve the child's education on the impact that that has on the child's ability to improve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that there could be a breakdown in care, and that maybe we could do this a little differently and be I more guess, coordinated. You know, one thing I might say is, how, how do you think you can weave her autonomy, not telling her to just stop smoking, you need to stop smoking. How, you as a provider, how would you go about approaching, you know, to get to a point where the child was exposed to less cigarette smoke, rather than just telling her to stop smoking? Okay, <laughs> good. I, wanted, I would ask her, why are you smoking? Is it stress? Is it there you go. Yeah. Let's get to the root cause yeah. Of why. Yeah. Good answer. So. Yeah. I'd also ask in front of the mom and the child how the smoking affects the child. Ask the child how the smoking affects the child. So all the other things that we could talk to her. You know how often we find your mom smoking. That sort of thing. So that it's a conversation once a day that's involving them. Yeah. That 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 was sort of my point. Is that yeah that by 
by approaching and respecting her, you're, you're actually getting to the, to the answer. I will mention one specific thing is, you ever heard of a smoking jacket? That's, that's protect, protect against third hand smoke. If somebody smokes outside with the jacket on, then they take the jacket off when they go inside, you actually have less cigarette exposure to the kids. So just something that's useful. And she may frankly want help with the smoking and just doesn't know how. Mm -hmm. I think a little bit about what we're getting at, because we, if this is what I call the, the clinician in all of us. Um, and so the ethical issue is on a systems level, um, what are our obligations for helping finance? So, I mean, again, insurance companies now, um, health insurance, sometimes they have uh, payment incentives or disincentives for people that smoke. Um, and those are kind of bring in some of the ethical issues um, related to larger systems. Um, and I think that's sort of what we are driving at a little bit with uh, going, going down that, that angle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, it's interesting you said that because smoking is the only behavior that we actually penalize. So, you know, we've started getting, some of the insurance companies have started started dipping their toes into BMI, but it's so problematic because we all have to eat, we don't have to smoke. Um, and so, you know, that, that is the only habit that we actually penalize. We don't penalize drinking. I mean, so it's fascinating that... And the, it's, a, it's wrapped up into, when we talk about social determinants of health, smoking is so wrapped up in, um, we learned about um, last week about the social determinants of health and that smoking, um, there are a lot of factors that lead people to, to smoke, smoke and there are definitely disparities in those that smoke. So again, um, yes, it, it's an autonomous decision mm -hmm. <laughs> to smoke, but is it really an autonomous decision? Um, and mm -hmm. It's also an addiction. Uh, so the question, sorry, I keep forgetting that we're being taped and that some others might not hear it, is uh, to return back, I think, probably to what you were saying. I think it was maybe Karen that was mentioning this, was, um, well, how do we practically, so we ask the patient, do you want help with this, the smoking? And, you know, it's so great. We've got some resources we can turn uh, to to try to remediate the issue. But what if she says no and you're kind of stuck? Is that, am, I, am I basically synthesizing your question? In a, so practically speaking, when we think of behaviors and their influence or impacts on inequalities, w what do we do at that point if they don't want help with the underlying behavior? I guess from my standpoint is uh, uh, you as a provider, don't, you don't give up. Many times I, I don't succeed the first visit or the second visit or even the third visit, <laughs> but you're persistent. And, and, and um, eventually, uh, you know, you establish a communication and a trust is, is how it works. And it rarely does fail me, eventually. So, so discussing smoking outside. I mean, I think, I think you know, in this example, smoking is, uh, I think most people know smoking is going to be bad for you and bad for your people that you live with. I think, you know, that's established. And so it's really just a question of how do you balance that and get that person to move to a position. Maybe you'll never get her to stop smoking, but I bet you've got a reasonable chance of getting her to smoke outside with a smoking mm -hmm. jacket. Um, that, that, that that is you know, quite possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but it takes persistence and it takes trust and, it, and, doesn't, and they don't want lecturing. It just yeah. I actually am really glad you mentioned How many of you have found by a show of hands that like transparency with your patients really works well in terms of you saying, look, I'm struggling here because my obligation is to do X, Y, and Z, and I'm hearing you say 
A, B, and C. So where can we kind of meet in the middle a little bit? Like what are you willing to do that, that, that might work from our end too? So here's some different options. You can maybe go smoke outside with a jacket. How do you feel about that? Like exploring the different options and maybe there's something they're gonna be more, that's an intervention that they might be more amenable to than just the full out scale uh, option that's very challenging to try to mitigate. Just a concrete way mm -hmm. is to ask permission. Mm -hmm. Right. Do something to help us, right? right. I mean, it's like, yeah. how could we work in the middle? Well, I'm not interested. Yeah. You know, I'm not ready to stop smoking. But to ask permission for sharing, like about the smoking jacket, to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of helps with the autonomy piece mm -hmm. and also the relationship building piece. I think your point's so well taken about the relationship. It's like within a relationship is where we have the best odds of influencing. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things that go through these. I mean, because like, I have this approach, and the other person that comes behind me, they don't have. I know. So that's what's breaking. There's so many consistencies of how you see life. And when you <coughs> know this, and like, yeah, you don't get across that person, but like, when I took your reason, like, in a setting that was the same, I was the same, you know, provider clinician there, yes, mm -hmm. you know, like, three days in a row, 48. But if I have one day, and I know that, they may get very offended by me, and they would not want me at all because, and I was like, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it, you know? Because they haven't figured out the clinician. I mean, we, we don't, we mm -hmm. have so many consistencies, so many ways to look at yeah. things that that's the biggest problem. I yeah, well, team-based care, as lovely as it is in a lot of settings, and it is, it brings in a lot of different resources, the frequent turnover yeah. does mm -hmm. challenge us in continuity of care and continuity of resources, frankly. What, one of the things that came to mind when I was looking at the case um, before we all met was the risk of imposing your personal bias or judgment mm -hmm. um, on the patient that you're with? And does that lead you down the path of, well, the smoking, she's always gonna have asthma because of the smoking, so do I even tackle any of these other? Mm -hmm. Is she worthy of my investing time and resources in tackling some of these other things? And I think that's, I don't have an answer, but when I was thinking about what are the ethical uh, concerns that c mm -hmm. could come up. I think we all have our biases and we need to recognize those and recognize how that um, shapes decisions that we make and treatments that we offer patients. I'm so glad you said that because that's great lead into our next question. What are the potential ethical pitfalls of screening for social determinants of health? You just mentioned one. <laughs> we could create some implicit biases by sticking mm -hmm. something in the medical record that may or may not be addressable that we might or may not have actually fully tackled from an interviewing perspective mm -hmm. that now is gonna linger and linger and linger. I don't know how many times, I know you guys have been there, how many times you've read a record about the daughter is angry and, and difficult and de or depressed and you're like, when you have the encounter, you have a totally different experience. Not to say that social determinants are the same as just attitudes, but sometimes things that weren't truly actually gathered in a very systematic way can be pervasive and stay in the chart a little bit longer. Yeah. So for the question that if I may explain, um, so for us, we talk so much about social determinants, but for us to actually make an impact on that is that we have to first of all work on our system. Uh, because if our system is not designed to address social determinants, mm -hmm. it will be hard for the provider. Exactly. Uh, so in the emergency room, for example, Mm -hmm. because it is emergency. Mm -hmm. So they are concerned with stabilizing the patient and there are so many patients lined up. Mm -hmm. So when you have another patient after that one, so how, where do you find the time to spend for mm -hmm. this particular patient when you have another patient that is waiting that have a mind mm -hmm. or something else that you have to jump on? So if a system is set up, Mm -hmm. housing, non-profit organization are somewhere around, whether they physically or somewhere, where the nurse can network immediately and do something about it. Yeah. After the provider stabilize the asthma and then these other people will take it from there. So if the system is designed like that, then the social determinant will work. If it's not designed yeah. like that, we can talk about it all day, but it's not really going to work because it takes time. 
for us to follow up with this particular patient. Even when the patient said, no, I don't want to quit smoking, I'm a nurse. It's just like giving a patient medicine and a patient say, I don't want this medicine. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to stop there because I have to slow down and find out why the patient don't want that medicine. There might be a reason. And when I identify that reason and be able to say, I know. okay, your reason for not taking this, is it because of this? And then I will give them the true education about that. Then the patient might turn around and say, okay, I thought this would happen. Yeah, like when you screen, but you don't fully actually explore what's going on, or you screen and don't fully address it, then are you possibly doing an ethical mm -hmm. disservice, or frankly, somehow really hurting them from an ethical standpoint to just basically drop off, to explore the issue, but not fully, and then back out of the case without any sort of continuity of care or handoff, which is dangerous. Um, I think at this point we might be well positioned to go into case two. Uh, I was just going to say, does anyone else have any other pitfalls? So the two big pitfalls are, that came up so far are three big pitfalls. Um, creating implicit bias, particularly implicit bias in the chart, which we know um, as, in, from lots of ar um, articles and literature out there that implicit bias does impact our management of patients. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the screening and not having a systems-based, the ability to make system-based change mm -hmm. um, and potentially causing harm by eliciting something that we can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else have other concerns about screening or identifying social determinants of health? I just wanted to mention because last week they talked about intimate partner violence and I was glad to see that. And that's one area where we have to be very careful when we're screening in terms of where do we go from there, what, it, what is the screen going to do, and you can't just leave it there. Mm -hmm. And so many times, and even, well, California looks at it being an issue for children exposed to the violence. And so where is that going to go? And we haven't really done the research to look at where these programs are helping or hindering, and sometimes it's wrapped up in custody and all of that. So I think we have to be very careful that we have those resources in place and we know that it's not going to do harm. Mm -hmm. And that's consistent with um, where major provider systems across the country are going as EMRs and other vendors make 31 flavors, all of these features available, all of this optionality to, um, to document social determinants practically, operationally, in a way where there's some sort of system or structure mm -hmm. that can receive and do something. Otherwise, it is a lot of potential talk or even worse, creating inadvertent, inadvertent biases by either not well-trained documentation or asking these questions. Is it in paper? Is it, is it, is it written? Is it um, spoken? It's, um, there's a real... Uh, uh, there are best practices out there, and um, later on I'm happy to give a specific example. But a lot of systems are not trying to boil the ocean. They're starting with a couple concrete examples that kind of hit a nexus of, um, of, of, of factors. Um, our, our, you know, top needs reflected in the um, patients, the population that they serve, and something where they have something they can do about it, either a program or an embedded partner or some um, system, an embedded air traffic controller uh, to be, you know, we've heard the, the terms um, uh, tossed around, whether it's called a population health ninja or um, a, 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 a social worker navigator or a, um, an embedded air traffic controller, that handoff to your care team member whose full-time job it is, is to do that warm referral. And just one other one other pitfall to the gentleman's point, I think um, there's a real likelihood of practitioner burnout if, you know, if we are asking and you can't do anything about it. And I think we do need to be really cognizant of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're, we're talking about a lot of uh, social determinants that are specifically patient-focused, which is totally fine with me. But there's an issue with what happens pre-stream as opposed to downstream. Um, how we're training potential caregivers, potential care providers, physicians, etc. cetera, is, is, in my experience, has been a, a major shift in what their focus might be. 
Um, another thing is we're talking about individualizing healthcare, yet we want to have an electronic health record that tells us how we're supposed to run things, where what's in that record very rarely is really specific to a particular patient's need. So I, I think that we need to back to those issues and issue noise as well as part of the substance of care noise, because it's not just the going from the patient into the community, but before that patient enters the room. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca, very quickly to your point, um, there is now uh, research on uh, that question of social determinants and um, physician burnout and whether um, across a series of domains. Knowledge about it, is that associated with higher or lower physician burnout? Ability to uh, feel confident screening for it as another factor. Um, ability for the clinic to actually do anything about it. And those first two are not associated with reducing physician burnout. The only one that's associated that has kind of that positive correlation to, 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 to feel less, to be less burned out is not just that I know what it is, not that just that I can, that I can confidently ask the question, that's not uh, associated. It's that there's something that the clinic can do, that my practice can do, that I've, um, yeah, so what it, so I absolutely. Yeah, exactly. yeah, we know that that makes a difference. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Great discussion on those issues. We're going to move to... Case number two, so what social determinants may be impacting Mr. X, who's a 54-year-old Hispanic male with diabetes, hypertension. He is overweight with um, or obese with a BMI of 35 and has just been told by his doctor that if he could just lose weight and exercise more, because that's so easy, right, his blood sugar and blood pressure would be under much better control. The doctor provides lots of handouts filled with information such as recipes and exercises. So... And um, I guess sort of, sorry, going back, you guys are all experts on this now. We kind of have like talked tons about social determinants of health, but some of the things that are related here, social determinants that may be impacting uh, this patient and his ability to just diet and exercise, what are some things that come to mind? Whether he has a place to eat and exercise. Whether he has a place to exercise and Does he have access to a grocery store? And uh, last week also they mentioned um, food insecurity and food deserts. Do you guys know what a food desert is? Because they didn't really, I don't think they talked that much about it. Okay, good. Everyone's nodding their head. Do you guys, someone want to say what a food desert is? And I believe it's a one mile away, correct? Like mm -hmm. a, there's no grocery store within one mile of where you live. Um, okay, so those are those are the big ones. And sure enough, um, he does not have a car, so he doesn't have a way to get transportation um, to any grocery store. The nearest grocery store is three miles away, and also has a limited selection of food. And two weeks ago, there was a gang-related shooting in the um, near, in his neighborhood near his complex. So you, somebody asked or mentioned, where does he live? So we talked about food deserts, we talked about transportation issues, and also violence, which has come up a little bit. Um, so which, which health in inequalities <laughs> might be considered to be health inequities? Does anyone want to take a stab at defining those two terms? Are they different to you? How are they different? Sometimes they're used interchangeably, but um, in the literature they're considered to be different. Health equity is having, um, I guess, equal access um, to health care. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess the question is, is it equal access? I see uh, Dr. Barnes over there, Anne, smiling. <laughs> Do you have a way that you like to define it? Um, yeah, so I usually think about um, achieving outcomes on the equity side. So do people have the same opportunity to achieve the outcome in question, where equality is everybody has access to the same thing, but that same thing might not get patient A to the outcome, even if it gets patient B to the outcome. 
So you may have to adjust what each person gets to get equity in the outcome that you're pursuing. Yeah, and so um, when I was talking about this presentation with my husband last night, I was like, it's so hard to define the differences between inequality and inequity. And he's like, well, equality is like the equal sign. It's like the same. <laughs> <laughs> Made it very simple. And I'm a very visual person. So I like the Robert yeah. Wood Johnson Foundation, like that, uh, their infographic that they have. And if you guys see, they show equality is everyone has a bike, right? so they're all equal, but no one can really ride that bike. Right. And so in the lower frame, if you guys, that picture may be easier for people to see on the um, other, your right-hand side. Um, but everybody has a bike that they can ride. That's right. Um, so that's equity. And, and ethically speaking, this is a great example of where we're not in agreement as to mm -hmm. what the goal should be. Right. So I would ask you to, again, as your own thought experiment, what should it be? What, what should the goal? Yeah, should riding the bike be the goal? Or does my obligation end if everybody gets a bike and Correct. you figure it out? Or is it to get where you're going? Mm -hmm. right. Regardless of the means. Right. Yeah. The means. Right. Absolutely. And that's one of the, th that's the outcome, right? mm -hmm. And another pair of words that kind of suss out some similar um, tough questions is health difference and health disparity. And um, if we could hold every other factor constant and equal, there might be differences in health for purely genetic reasons because we're not all identical twins. Um, Disparity, like in equity, connotes some sense of injustice or unfairness, or there was lack of access to equal opportunity. And so when you pair that with our earlier conversation about behaviors where there can be, on a continuum, some sense that that was fully an autonomous choice, and you are uh, bearing the natural consequences of that choice, all the way to what um, the evidence shows us in um, uh, more recent decades that sometimes even what may appear to be the most autonomous choice can be driven by what you were exposed to as a kid and um, behaviors that were modeled for you and all of, so that's that really sticky area that we're in right now. But there's something we have not actually emphasized with you that I think is worth emphasizing because honestly it took me forever to understand the distinction between inequity and inequality. One of them actually has a, a moral association with it. In other words, a fairness element. Inequity means there's an inherent unfairness. In equality does not necessarily mean that there's anything unfair. So, Karen, how tall are you? 5'3". Okay, you're 5'3". I'm 5'7". If we both played basketball, or we both tried to play basketball, I'm not very good at it, I'd say that we both probably have an equal shot at getting an opportunity to play basketball, right? Now, would I be a little bit more advantaged because of how tall I am? Probably. But is there any inequality? Not necessarily. The inequity might be somewhere along the lines as if she didn't have the same amount of access. Like, it's just not fair. We need to do something to help her get to where I'm at to, to do just as well in basketball. So think about it in terms of the fairness element is associated with inequity. Inequality has no moral judgment associated with it whatsoever as long as there's is there, there's equities involved. Does that make sense? So that which leads us to the other question about our gentleman who um, lacks access to a grocery store, transportation, um, and lives in a potentially violent neighborhood. Um, how, how can we, oh, you know what, I think I went past, how should we decide, sorry, um, which health inequalities between the different social groups should be considered fair or unfair? So in our particular patient, which things, social determinants, are unfair? Do you want to turn back yeah, to the case? Yeah, let me go back to this slide.
not in the food desert necessarily. Mm -hmm. And you have, you know, a rambler from the ACB across the street from each other. I don't think we're even tackling that on a, a, a societal level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the um, comment was the food insecurity, the food desert, that there's no grocery store in the area. We have a ton of grocery stores in Houston. Mm -hmm. You could say that it's not really, if we counted the number of grocery stores per capita, we're probably just about right. <laughs> but um, there are inequities in where they're actually placed. There are great video series about, hung I mean, there's quite a few, but about hunger in America and mm -hmm. food deserts. But one of the examples that I, that stands out in my mind is I mean, they talk about, yes, there are places to buy food, but they're often the little small stores, and they don't have any fresh produce, kind of like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they can buy stuff, but it's all processed and not natural and no fruits and vegetables. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so the point is that we did walk for an hour to go to the grocery store and we sat on different buses. So I think it's, you can't just say the system has to deliver, it's going to do what it's going to do. Um, so yes, there's probably some public transportation, but I think there also has to be a will from the select to say, like, hey, I mm -hmm. want to get fresh, uh, fresh food, you know? Um, so I think what we can do as a system is draw an invitation and say, this is So you actually bring up a really good point, and again, back to the ethics issue and the question, or the point that Rebecca made at the very beginning, is what is fair? I mean, there are grocery stores. There is a grocery store three miles away. Maybe that is fair, you know? Um, it, so it, it's your perception of um, maybe they need education on how to get transportation to get to the grocery store. So uh, again, there's, um, there's a moral judgment about what you um, individually that we feel is fair, but also collectively as a community, as a, a society, and sometimes even as institutions. As Karen mentioned, what Harris Health System is doing, and what Anne's mentioned that Legacy is doing, those are um, institutional decisions on what they are prioritizing or they feel is are important um, health factors that they're going to address, right? So they're making a, a value judgment on, it on what they're doing. Shot. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And how much food can he buy if you're walking to go to the grocery store? You can only bring like one or two bags of food. And so you can't buy a week of food or two weeks of food and it's snowing outside. So you're not definitely, you're going to be trying to run. <laughs> Okay, she's from Flint, Michigan, because you actually bring up a very good, important part. What did she say? She's from Flint, Michigan. There's no grocery store in Flint, and we're in a water crisis. Of course, yeah. So she's from Flint, Michigan, and they're in a water crisis. And actually, I'm really glad that you brought that up, because it was a point that I was going to make earlier, 
that the reason that the water crisis actually came to light when it did was because a pediatrician mm -hmm. was doing checking and noticed Good. that some of our patients had elevated lead levels, went to the lab and said, hey, can we go over all these patients that are getting lead levels? And they noticed that there were a lot of kids that had elevated lead levels. And then when she made the announcement, she did it in a, a press, re press release. Um, so there were a lot of media folks around when she actually announced it. And you probably actually know more about it than I did. But I just, it was an individual clinician, health practitioner, that identified the problem um, with the community and then brought it to light. So again, sort of going back to the whole thing, where does our obligation start um, as health professionals? Um, and, and how far do we go with that information? Um, and right. so, oh. go ahead. I was just gonna, gonna mention, you know, we sort of think of ourselves as, as providers in the clinic, um, but I'd also say that you all are, are, are experts. You have the other potential is outside of the clinic, as a member of the community. And, and you can take this information and, 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 then, and to really work towards, in, in this case, uh, a healthy uh, uh, work at walking environment, a park, um, improving, being part of community associations, that you are a voice of expertise and you've got you know, some input in that. And that's sort of the long range plan. But I think us in the healthcare profession, uh, sometimes we're, we're not as much a part of the community, but really being involved in your professional organization, in your local community, your PTA, your, uh, your neighborhood board association, those sorts of things uh, are also important and that you will be listened to no matter what you are. You've got this, you know, the cert certification, the experience, that, that that's important. And, that's, and, and many, many great diseases and things just like the case with the, the lead in, the, in the, the water in the Flint, Michigan, is, was, was identified by individuals. I mean, if you go through history, a lot of diseases and problems were identified. They weren't, weren't picked up by the CDC initially. They were picked up by an individual clinician in a clinic someplace that said, hey, I've got a cluster of these things. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I did want to mention is and another way you can be sort of an epidemiologist in your clinic is simply coding, uh, coding things that you, apps that you see. So when I saw those exposures from that tank fire, I could have said asthma. <laughs> I did say asthma, but I also did exposure to air pollution because that's what the history said. And so somewhere along the way, somebody can pick up you know, on that study. And I'm not saying don't do that lightly. You need to be sure what you're doing. But that, that you're all very empowered beyond just your own job. You're all part of the community. You know, I, what I really like about that, it's right along these lines, what I really like about the Flint example, she didn't actually go way outside of her traditional practice to figure out how to help these patients. She thought about what resources do I have right now that I can figure out what problem is going on. I have access to the lead levels because I work in a children's hospital. So why don't I pull the lead levels so that I can systematically analyze that? Didn't take much work. And then she thought, and I've got access to media. So you didn't have to, you know, the advocacy can look, on a, can look a, very different depending on who you are. And tr making a difference can honestly, in terms of uh, mm -hmm. trying to address social determinants, can, doesn't have to take all that much uh, effort. There, I think it's cholera, maybe it's not cholera, but there's some example from the 1800s where the reason why the physici a physician, a local community doc, not an organization, realized that it was caused by water was because he looked at the, um, the water fountain and mapped out all the different examples of, there you go. Okay, so he was able to take a map and figure out where all these patients were getting sick and then figured out what common feature do all of these have in common and made a huge, huge discovery. And as a result, you know, we, I know, because he was a, I know. And he was an odd guy, and that didn't really help. You were about well. to have a comment, too. And then we're going to transition, because you guys already sort of started talking about like our individual responsibility. And then as our responsibility as a member of an organization or a larger community, um, where we can make change as a, with a collective voice. Yes. I just wanted to bring it back to the health, uh, the ethics and the health policy, because there are so many things. And as a public health nurse, community health nurse, family nurse practitioner, we can't do it alone. And, and that's the beauty of us getting together here because I can remember one community assessment we did in one of the neighborhoods in Houston where the person, uh, there were a lot of crack houses. So number 
really wanted to bother with this neighborhood. And our students went in and did a community assessment and found that the fire hydrants were, and this was a place that was prone to fire, they had to be mowing the grass around the fire hydrants. So when the fire department oh. came in, they couldn't find the fire department. This is totally social determinants of health. And they went to the mayor's office and they got them to come and just, and that's a real inequity situation. Another situation where um, it was outside of Harris County where the patients had to go to John Keeley from Wallace County to John Keeley to be seen. And if they weren't uh, able to come to Harris Health. And then they would sit there all day in the ambulatory care center because they had cardiac conditions. At first they had to have ambulatory care. They have the transportation issues and then they have to come all the way back and maybe not even be seen after all of that. So, I mean, there's just so much system-wise that we need to do and it, it doesn't, you know, happen with one discipline. All right, so that's actually a great segue. Thank you. The two things, there were two examples given. One was about a community needs assessment in a, house, in a community that was filled with crack houses. Uh, no one wanted to go in and do it. They did it. They found that the fire hydrants were covered up and the fire departments couldn't find them. So they went to the mayor's office and they got it addressed. So sort of collective advocacy in that sense. And then another example of issues with access. Um, communities where they don't have a public health system like Harris Health System because they had their their county has elected not to fund that level of health care um, but having their the patients that needed to be seen by health professionals go like outsourcing it to a whole different community that is like skips a, skips over a county to get there so um, we were going to give you guys <laughs> Five million dollars. <laughs> so we're now going to go to, if you will, a macro problem. So we've been talking one patient, a practitioner. Now you are in the position, you've just received a five million dollar grant to spend on health care for patients with diabetes. How are you going to spend this money? How do you ethically decide what you're gonna, what you're gonna do, and we even gave you some suggestions. What do you think? How do we start making sense of this? You guys give us suggestions. Do you want us to read them out? Yeah, let's read them out. Oh. Provide funding for diabetic medications for those patients who are unable to pay for their meds. Yeah. Oh. Give the money to the parks department to build walking tra trails. Support fruit and vegetable programs in neighborhoods considered to be food deserts. And D, collaborate with Metro to provide free transportation to all patients going to an appointment. Did any of those stick out as being, well, it's more compelling than the others? <laughs> okay. Okay, but you can't, you can't afford all of them, right? Let, let's just go with this. Five million dollars is only going to get you one of these, okay? <laughs> Um, <laughs> sir, <laughs> what? C. C is support food and vegetable programs in the neighborhoods. Why did you choose that? Okay, so. The thought was is that you're getting to the root cause of the disease. That if you can change the diet, you can reverse the disease process. So the biggest bang for your buck, perhaps? Does anyone else have a different thought about this? Ma'am. <laughs> I wouldn't eat any of the veggies. So. I, you know what? So, and what do you do in that case? And, and I think that you, that is a fabulous observation because if we don't get the community involved at the get-go, we could be distributing food and vegetables that goes to complete waste. That's a brilliant comment. And you know, oh, I was just going to say, go ahead. But they, they also have two food programs. <laughs> Legacy and Harris Health is working are working on two different food programs. So it, 
as soon as our speakers mention, I mean, our, our audience mentions their we'll hear that. thoughts, yeah, I would love to hear like what you guys are working on. Well, wait, so let the person in front first, yeah. Another brilliant response. We need more information. So before we can actually start thinking about solutions, we need to find out, OK, who is this population? Type 1, type 2. Again, get some additional things. Real quick, you had a comment, and then we're going we're gonna to hear from Harris Health. Oh, well, yeah, that's OK, so what is Harris Health doing? So we're opening our first uh, food pharmacy in um, full partnership with the Houston Food Bank at Strawberry uh, Health Center, which is in Deeply Food Insecure Pasadena. Um, and uh, on the opposite end of the care continuum spectrum, we're opening one at our community hospital campus early next year, um, LBJ, which is in both a food desert, a transportation desert, it's a medical desert. Um, I think what we were kind of dancing around in the earlier conversation is that that structural inequality, it's not the same, it's different. All of these social factors always point in one direction for certain zip codes. And for a lot of us, that's how it can start to go down the continuum more towards an inequity when it always points in the same direction. Um, as an aside, we struggle with transportation with our patients where sometimes um, a community may be much further <coughs> away as the crow flies miles and miles further, but the public transportation, because that's an affluent community, it's the express bus, whereas there's one only a mile away, but it's a milk truck stop where you have to stop 10 times to even go that mile and a half. So uh, in recognizing um, that it's a hard decision because there literally are not enough acute downstream beds for all of the need in Harris County, so how do we explain, know your audience, work with our, um, our clinical partners and um, uh, the, the various stakeholders that all have a stake. Um, each taxpayer has a stake in Harris Health. Uh, why are we, when there could be infinite downstream need, investing in this upstream work? Um, the uh, reasoning includes getting at the root cause, mm -hmm. knowing that because there's some interventions that are so much more efficient upstream over time, and there are, there's good evidence now uh, that for every uh, drop in one point of A1C, you're saving the health system $2,200. That's even before we talk about all those other benefits to the individual, to society, just the health system in reduced um, admissions, reduced ED visits, uh, the cost of the amputation. I mean, how do you price out something like that? Um, so it's, it's to get at the root cause, and it's to make that efficiency uh, uh, argument. Um, and then it's also, I, I think, related and, and, and wrapped up in that is this idea of um, it takes a village. And so uh, getting into the practice of partnering with other members of that village, other instrumentalists in that symphony that are very good at doing what they're doing. We are not becoming experts in refrigeration. We're not becoming experts in food distribution. We're not becoming experts in what's best in season uh, to keep the food pharmacy stock. That's all outsourced to the Houston Food Bank and getting used to doing those partnerships and that it takes a village. I think that is as important or even more important than which intervention you're choosing to partner with. It's getting in the practice of doing it together. Uh, sure, I can talk a little bit about um, what we're doing around food. So we universally screen at all our clinics about food insecurity, um, and the food bank is the go-to um, organization around this. Uh, we have a partnership now where we actually bring in experts from the food bank to help uh, patients that we see who are interested in SNAP benefits um, to, to help them fill out their application to get those benefits that are already there. So again, not creating something, but there's a system in place that can help people get the food that they need, um, and why not part with, partner with them um, to serve the patients that we see. 
we're actually exploring the um, food prescription program as well and hope to implement that at our sites as well, um, where awesome. patients can actually Love get, it. yeah, Love they it. can get produce. Um, I think one of the challenges that we have as I was listening to how do you, how do you get food where food needs to be, which might be where you want to spend your $5 million um, to benefit people and their health downstream. I think there's a real struggle so I, I don't want to, I'll just call it Grocery Store X. Grocery Store X needs to be somehow tied to Hospital Y. Their futures have to be tied together and their finances have to be tied together for them to see how being in this community is going to save us overall. Um, I'm not sure that we're there yet, um, but that's a challenging, everybody kind of still what's in it for me system-wise, but I think as a community we're going to have to figure out how, how what I do that helps the community benefits you, but I still get some benefit as well. So, it, I, no, 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 because this is the question I want to end with. Okay. Because <laughs> um, it is a huge policy question yeah. that I'd like you to go home with, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. So, Karen, you just talked about how dollars are getting transferred away from the hospital system mm -hmm. into other systems. And if you study our European neighbors, mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you add up all the money they spend on upstream social determinants and, and lump that into healthcare spending, our spending overall is very equal. Yeah, and so awesome. what I'm wondering is, what are the policy implications of taking money out of our what we term as a healthcare system mm -hmm. into these other systems where heretofore we have not been willing to make investments? Anyone? You want to take that? <laughs> Did you pose the question? No, I, I don't. Yeah. I, <laughs> That's hard. I have thoughts about it, but I. I Two thoughts. One, um, Anne reminded me that part of the messaging at Harris Health is our top three diagnoses. Top three. Hypertension, Diabetes. hyperlipidemia, unmanaged A1C. Those are all food and diet related. Yeah, they are. Uh, unmanaged uh, diabetes. diabetes. And then fourth, at most of our clinics, the fourth kind of varies depending on which neighborhood is obesity. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, so when you talk about a value proposition, starting with the low hanging fruit, it can get, you know, the, I hope, I hope one day, 30 years from now, we get so good at this that the practical trade-offs really are that, that, that challenging. But right now there are so many opportunities to do a little bit here and to show a value proposition um, that Yes, clinicians who are burnt out and believe that the, end, the flow of patients is endless, you know, and we're sitting right at the edge of the waterfall, preventing them from uh, 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 slipping over, and, and we are missing some, that, yeah, they want to go upstream. They're more open mm -hmm. to going upstream to figure out who or what are throwing the people into the water. The other thing I will say is know your audience, know your audience, know your audience. Are you speaking to an organization running like a business where you have to explain institutional ROI? which is a fancy way of saying, can you actually save the hospital enterprise money, the provider system itself money through reduced readmissions, right. reduced ED usage, um, reduced over time? Can you show that, you know, a, a drop in one point of A1C for each Harris Health patient equals this much in Harris Health savings? That's the easy place to start. And that's where most of the pilot should start. Because once you build some buy-in, you build some of that trust, you build those relationships, then you start getting into the really thorny questions of community ROI, mm -hmm. where part of what I'm saying, saving is going to save the food bank money, but not you, or not exclusively you. And that's why I like the way this hypothetical is written, because it talks about someone who sits at the top of that food chain, the county commissioner, who shouldn't care whether it's public health, Harris Health, 
uh, Harris County rides the transportation department, which agency is saving money as long as net we are saving money? And that, I think, elucidates what you're getting at, which is the communities where this has worked best, there is some sort of formal or informal governance strategy where there's shared vision, shared alignment, mm -hmm. and somebody has to play mommy or daddy. A little bit of sponsorship. It doesn't mean it's not always the government, but there does have to be some aligning force because otherwise it absolutely gets parochialized. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, 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 say it. <laughs> <laughs> and it came up last week, the ROI, return on investment, and it's coming up at the end of our talk now, right when we are ending and finishing up. But that we were talking about social determinants of health and health outcomes, and we started with the, uh, the question of what's really important, which outcomes and which health outcomes, and we, were, we started going down that track, well, this is gonna save you money. And so um, that, that's our, our balance or our question. Um, how do we uh, keep an ethical lens when we are creating and implementing health policies uh, so to, to meet all of the stakeholders needs. So ultimately we want everyone to have better health mm -hmm. and health outcomes, um, but it comes back to the money thing too. Yes. So we are out of time. Um, and do you want to wrap it up since? Well, I was, thank you guys for this. We, we, I put some, we put some resources here. Um, some of them were mentioned last week. We just wanted to have them. These are um, places where you can get data uh, about different county level health determinants, and sometimes it's broken down a little bit smaller um, by metropolitan areas. Um, the uh, healthofhouston.org, Dr. Linder last week mentioned that's going to be coming out in a few weeks, that has a, uh, health information broken down by neighborhoods. Um, we'll be here for a few minutes if you guys have questions since we're concluding right now, and we thank you again for your participation. Thank you so much. Thank you.